study processes and procedures, basic drafting, uh, because we do a lot of, uh, you know, training on okay. the ground. So at that point, it's like, it's like point an internship. Is, is in, not an sure. internship exactly, okay. actually, when you look at it. Okay. So for the first one year, is working around departments, mm. just to, even to get the language of the institution. Okay. And thereafter, of course, uh, after two years, we were taken for training, mm. a training that took us uh, 10 months. Fortunately, that was 1992-93. Okay. And one of my classmates was a Ghanaian. Interesting. <laughs> a Ghanaian in, at the University of Nairobi. Okay. You know, and uh, I'm still looking for him. I'm told that uh, he is not longer in service. So I have tried to look for him. I'm but do you know that, if he's still in Kenya or no, he's moved back to Ghana? That was 1993. Yeah, so that was a while So back. that's a long time ago. Yeah. He has been everywhere. He came back, but he's not at the Ministry of okay. Foreign Affairs in Ghana. He has retired. If we know his name, we can find him for you. I'm looking for him very seriously. I don't want him to be surprised. I have sent word everywhere <laughs> just to make sure that I connect back with him. And uh, of course, uh, thereafter, um, came back to the ministry headquarters, worked in a number of departments. At that particular time, I was very privileged to work in one of uh, the senior, under the sen a very senior officer, almost what we call the technical director of the ministry. At the time, we were dealing with uh, huge issues. One of the key issues that time was the peace processes, peace process in Sudan, under the Intergovernmental Authority and Development, IGAD. So it gave me a good opportunity to just appreciate, uh, you know, some of those uh, difficult issues and diplomacy and, and the international conflicts and diplomacy. And of course, uh, you could see the number of players and the efforts that uh, the Sudanese had tried to make before they could actually come to the table. Uh, 95, I was uh, fortunate to get my first posting out abroad. Uh, I went briefly to to Bonn. Okay. Bonn then, of course, Germany, Germany had not reunited. So uh, yes, I mean, this is to, still just, yeah, just after the, the yeah, exactly. post-Cold War yes, era. Yes, yes. So still very So early. I was there for three months mm -hmm. and then, of course, proceeded on to Vienna. So I... Italy. Yeah. <laughs> we just opened our mission in Vienna. Oh. And therefore, I was fortunate to be actually the person that... Uh, so you were the very first yes, High Commissioner to Vienna? No, not High Commissioner, because at that time I was a low-level officer, okay, really. Okay, okay. But nonetheless, I was in charge of the, of the, of the mission. Okay, so you... So, you so were... I went to establish the mission and I was there as the team leader for 15 months. That is brilliant. You know, that was 95. And you were young then? I was much younger than I, than I am today. Because <laughs> uh, close to 25 years, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I was in Vienna, very interesting city, very interesting issues for discussion. What in diplomacy we call is a multilateral station. Multilateral station meaning it has a number of international organizations and agencies that you look into. And a lot of work that we, we, we were engaged with. One of the major, I think, success stories is up to date because of the effort that was made in 1995, 96 and 97. We still have the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO. After three years of service, I came back to the headquarters. Very interesting uh, engagements again. So this is back to Kenya? Back to Kenya in 98. Uh, 98 was interesting because I also got opportunity to serve in a department that was dealing with uh, international organization matters. Okay. At the time, there was... Uh, effort to come up with a convention of small arms mm -hmm. and uh, I was fortunate also to be tasked uh, to coordinate and develop a framework and program of work on how we can move a declaration we had agreed on within our region that we were calling the Nairobi Declaration on Small Arms and Light Weapons, okay. illicit small arms, light and, uh, illicit small arms mm -hmm. and light weapons. What, was it a huge problem at the time, illicit small arms? Absolutely, it is to you to date. Mm. Because when you look at the cross border and when you look at the ethnic conflict and when you look at the cattle sling and when you look at everything else, including border and including armed guns, mm. including in cities, and uh, breaking into banks and uh, whatever else. Yeah. So there was the whole question how do you now begin to manage and, Where do you even and find take them? away <laughs> and take away? Illegal, illegally held weapons from the from the from the citizens, yeah. because 
one, if you want an, uh, to be armed, then you need to apply for a license and the, you are registered. But again, the challenge was a lot of those were already out there. Second, there was no register of those ones. Third, a number of them came without even uh, a re uh, even without marks, so they don't ha they are not marked, right. and uh, it became a big problem. So we were lucky and able to begin to develop the, uh, a process. A document we were able to develop a document within the Eastern Africa. I was the coordinator of that. Mm. We established offices within the East African region. Following the success of what Nairobi had achieved, uh, we shared that documents to the rest of the African continent and we were able to sit in Bamako here okay. in 1990 in, in, in 1999 okay. and we were able to come up with an African position paper. So you were able to achieve this in about a year? In about uh, one and a half years we were able to make a lot of progress around that. In fact that that again as I mentioned earlier perhaps gained my first ticket to Accra. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> because uh, I was invited to speak and to share experiences of the Eastern Africa on how they have come up with that documentation to the ECOWAS. So in 1990, end of 1990, I was fortunate to come to Accra and I was able to share the experiences of uh, what we had uh, gone this through. This is end of 19, 1999? 1999, okay. uh, 2000. Okay, so this was your first time in Accra? That was my first time in Accra. Has it changed much since then? Ah, uh, it's a long time, uh, and uh, we were able to see around, but of course when you go for a conference, most of the time you're actually in the building. Yeah. So I've been looking for that hotel, I can't remember what name it was, but it was quite close to the sea. What as I remember there was a club that was called uh, Next Door, Next Step. Is okay, it next, next, next. was it, was, okay, so it's a, was it Ravico Hotel, do you remember? I, I wouldn't remember. Okay. The only one I know, of course, is that we were fortunate to be taken to Almina okay. so, uh, for a tour and we went yeah. through the motion and it was, it was beautiful. Okay, so, but all this while you are still working with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs yes. back in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. So, after this huge success that you chalked in 1999-2000, what happened next? The interesting thing is that uh, after we agreed on that document, there was a first session of the United Nations in New York meeting to develop uh, the convention mm -hmm. and uh, we were able to take that document in 19 in 2001 and I think that document enjoyed a lot of support <laughs> so we were have to, we had a special session in June of uh, 2001 was on small arms and the document was able to carry the day that is the beginning really of coming up with a convention on it is a small arms and light weapons mm -hmm. as are uh, known today. Yeah. So we played our part that time as a, uh, you know, from the Nairobi to within Eastern African region, the African uh, commun uh, the African Union itself mm -hmm. with a document from Bamako and we were able to share that document globally and I think it got a lot of acceptance. Brilliant. So that's again. Brilliant. Yeah. So did the journey continue? I mean, journey I'm continue, sure there were things yes. in between 2001 and 2020 when you ended oh, yes. up in Ghana because I mean the mission again yeah. in Ghana yeah. has begun with you. Exactly. So what happened in between? You have 19 yeah, years. Half, yeah, half uh, <laughs> 2000 and uh, 2000 and end of 2001, 2002, the government took the decision to reopen its mission in uh, Kigali, Rwanda. Okay. You know, after the genocide, yes. a number of missions closed, and it took a little bit of time to go back in, from 1994. So I was uh, tasked to lead the team to reopen our embassy in Rwanda. What was that like? Because this is post-genocide Rwanda. This is post-genocide Rwanda. Um, at that particular time, of course, uh, they, were, they were trying to re-establish themselves. Uh, certainly, there was a leadership that was taking shape, but one of the areas they were is the establishment of the institutions, mm -hmm. because uh, really the institutions were, that were there almost collapsed, yeah. and therefore it was coming up with new institutions, and uh, being the region, I think we worked very closely with the government of Rwanda on many areas. In the education sector, we had our teachers there. In the ICT sector, we had uh, teams that were leading, including at the ministries, the banking sector, we had uh, some Kenyans at the central bank and uh, with the banking sector. 
Uh, the security uh, area, we had uh, very good collaboration across uh, the entire spectrum. And uh, the hospitality, the establishment of the hospitality industry. So we had a lot of uh, Kenyans that were doing, including yeah. business. And actually. even personally, I, I see a lot of collaboration between Kenya and, and Rwanda. And yes. Well. So Nairobi and Kigali. Yes. So it's not that we are in Kigali. If you don't do nightlife in Nairobi, you yes. haven't actually experienced time in Eastern Africa. Yes. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I'm particularly interested in how you managed um, the young people I'm sure you have to work with in Kigali. Because, yes. I mean, it, it's very sad, but it's a reality we have to face as a continent that an entire generation was wiped out with a genocide. And you find that even now a lot of the institutions are headed by very young people. What was that like for you? you know? I think one, the, 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 it's very sad that, uh, you know, um, Rwanda had to go through that, that very painful and tragic uh, moments. But again, when we look, reflect back, you also saw a leadership that came up and so determined that they had nothing to leave behind to succeed. And I think they have made that abundantly clear to the world. Oh, yes. Very, very, very clear. We are here to succeed. Mm -hmm. During our moment of our hour of need, I think we were literally almost abandoned. Mm -hmm. So they are charging their own cause very clearly. And of course, all the way from the leadership from uh, the president himself, President Kagame. Mm -hmm. And uh, because 2001 was uh, really also a formative stage. So they actually dealt away with a lot of uh, these bureaucratic uh, mm -hmm. procedures so in terms of engagement and in terms of access we had very good uh, contacts and networks at very high levels so we were able to push a number of things if they had any requirement and need mm -hmm. it was very easy to access the offices but again i think they trusted kenya mm -hmm. they trusted kenya in many ways and uh, to date i think we maintain very very strong bonds mm -hmm. in terms of capacity building and in terms of institution building and development. So I think as a country, we have worked very closely and I see a lot of their institutions almost being mirroring what we actually do back, uh, back in Kenya. I haven't really studied the business terrain of Nairobi, Yes. but Kigali, yes. you find young people below 30, about 10 of them, and they've built a million dollar building. Yes. And people are renting out office mm -hmm. spaces yes. there, you know? Yeah. Okay, so, so from Kigali, yeah. where did you go to next? I was <laughs> in Kigali for four and a half years. Again, came back to the headquarters. Uh, for a period of time, I was deployed at the headquarters, uh, which was about six months. And then I found my way at the National Defense College. Okay. How? Um, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Yes. Uh, well, as a faculty member. Uh, because uh, we are co-sponsors of the National Defense College. Because National Defense College revolves around uh, the question of strategy, mm -hmm. not really operation. Okay. And when you're thinking about the national strategy, which can address issues of what you call the national security or the national uh, interests, it is, you need to bring on board all the players around that. So since the ministry, we co-sponsor co that with the Ministry of Defense. And therefore, as a ministry, we also have, a, um, uh, you know, we have an office there. Mm -hmm. uh, we had elections in 2008. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, the elections <laughs> went, uh, uh, 2007 actually. 2007. December, yeah. December 2007. But we were dealing with the aftermath uh, yes, of 2008. Yes, and then uh, 2000, uh, we had uh, contested elections. Uh, we thought because uh, we have not really gone through a civil war, we did not go through a coup. So I think we were too confident that uh, we were mature, that we will not get ourselves there. And we found ourselves almost at the cusp <laughs> yeah, of a falling into a serious crisis. And uh, when that happened, um, I was invited back to the ministry. But uh, I'm not from the media. <laughs> <laughs> so that was baptism by fire. I was called to come over, so I was there and uh, I was able to sit in that office for about a year. Until of course the crisis when we went through the Nairobi uh, processes and uh, we were able to do the, 
uh, to agree on uh, how to move forward and of course the grand coalition government. So we, we were able to overcome that and uh, thereafter, uh, end of 2008, I went to India. India? Yeah. Okay, so you were, you were elevated to the rank of ambassador while you were in Delhi? Yes. Okay, so, you, so from being a member of the mission, high-ranking member of the mission, now you became the ambassador. No, no, I had an ambassador, but uh, we have a system now that will even allow, depending on the workload in the mission. Okay. We have a number of missions that have two ambassadors. Okay. You know, uh, some of those that will have big workload. Most of them, you know, the United, within the United Nations and a few other bilateral missions. We have those that will. But at that particular time, by the time I was uh, promoted to the rank, I was a deputy. I see. Okay. So now back to Nairobi headquarters. Yes. Mm -hmm. And from there, straight to Accra. Straight to Accra, <laughs> yes. watching Diplomatic License on City TV and I've been playing golf with His Excellency. We've been having conversations about his diplomatic journey and how he landed in Accra and I'm sure a lot of you have been very excited to hear that our president has been making us proud. So stay tuned, there's more. Wrap this up. We'll be right back. The conversations that help you shape your spiritual journey as a Christian. Find the answers you seek. Catch The 700 Club with Pat Robertson every Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m. on City TV. Welcome back. You're still watching Diplomatic License on City TV. Once again, my name is Apioko, and I have been speaking to His Excellency, the High Commissioner of Kenya to Ghana, and we played golf today. We did a lot of interesting things, got to hear about his diplomatic journey and how he ended up here in Ghana. And now he's so graciously, together with his family, welcomed us into his home. And we have a, a very beautiful Kenyan spread here, <laughs> Your Excellency. <laughs> what, what are some of the things that we have here? In Kenya, we have a, a number of uh, cuisines. Uh, we unfortunately have not been able to prepare all of them for reasons that uh, we are still settling. So uh, the team that is here, my family, uh, my wife is there. Her name is Pamela. Uh, we have uh, one of our, our daughter. She is uh, Kendi, who has actually familiarize herself and done most of all this. I'm sure she has had some help. Oh, she's a phenomenal mother. chef. Yes. <laughs> and of course, we have the young man uh, who is not here with us, but he has gone up. And uh, he is also watching, and I'm sure one day he should be able to put up this. Now, uh, Kendi, if you're available, I think you can be able to take us through uh, why you chose what we will have Hi. prepared. Uh, how are you doing? I'm good. Okay, so my name is Apioko. I'm Kendi. Okay, thank you so much. I'm very honored to be in your home. Thank, thank you, you for, for having us. Me. Thank you for having us. But thank you even more for taking it because I'm told you prepared this entire spread. Okay, mom mm. helped me. <laughs> <laughs> but you masterminded it. Yes. You can say so. Okay, so could you tell us, let's start here. What's this? Mandazi. Mandazi. Yeah. Okay, how is it made? Okay, so mandazi is basically made with using self-rising flour and you add some sugar and 
a bit of salt just to level it out okay. and after that you put a bit of vanilla essence but depending on where you're from in Kenya because it's very wide some people the people of Mombasa like to use a bit more spices on it like cardamom and everything but ours is a bit more simple and basic okay what's cardamom it's a spice okay. what, what, what does it taste like I'm just wondering it's a bit um it's a savory more okay, spicy okay. More savory. spice okay. 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 Um so vanilla essence, sugar, milk, water and some baking flour and you mix that all and it's going to give you like a thick dough. Okay. You put that aside, let it rest, let it rise and after that you can roll it out, cut it into those pieces. Okay. Fry it okay. until it becomes like this. Okay. Now I'm I'm smiling a lot because it. I mean the preparation, and I suspect it because when I saw it and I smelled it, the viewers, it smells very much and like like a chomo. It even looks like it. So an achomo is something we have here. I don't know if you're familiar with what's another part of the world they call chin chin. So same preparation, just that we don't use any raising agents. And we roll it out, cut it up into little strips, cut it into squares, and then we fry it. So it's hard, more like little biscuits instead of, I'm guessing, can I taste this? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> mm. It's like soft touch on. It is. <laughs> <laughs> we have probably something that's a bit more from close to... Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's called angumu, but it's just as thick and but it's hard as well. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so I'm seeing the similarities in the cuisine already. Yeah. Okay, and what's that on the other end? Chapati. chapati? Ah, okay. Chapati. How do you make your chapatis? Because I've had several different kinds. Yeah, there are many <laughs> different kinds depending on where you're from or what you like or what you what you like to eat. Um, ours has just the flour, all-purpose flour, okay. with some salt and sugar. We like to add some onions and pumpkins sometimes. Mm. So when you have that, you mix it up and you make a dough with it. And you add some oil and you knead those together. Okay. And so then, you add the oil to the dough? Yeah, okay. to the dough. And then you put it aside, let it rest. Some this one I think was left to rest overnight. Mm. Even the madazi, most of our foods you let them rest before you go back to it. Okay. Then you roll it out, you put oil, and then you roll it up and cut it into pieces. And with those pieces, you knead the pieces again, and you put them down and roll it out again to make the chapatis and then you put them onto a flat pan with a bit of oil and you cook each side for a few minutes or seconds depending on how high your heat okay. is and the type of pan that you're using and that's basically it. Okay, so it, I mean so in terms of how you, you actually cook it, it's like a pancake yeah. almost. Okay. But you just flip it a few more times than you would a pancake. Okay. Oh, interesting. And okay, so what's this? Um, this is Giveri. 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 Yeah. Giveri. Okay. Um, it's a beans and maize stew, but we fry it. So at first, we normally boil the beans and the maize separately. So once those are boiled, you cut up your onions, your ginger, garlic, and all everything else that you'd like to put in everybody makes it differently this is just <laughs> our way of doing it we add some tomatoes um some bell peppers okay. carrots peas and you add the potato okay. depending on where you're from really it differs mm. so it sounds very much like that. So, when, when I, your, your Excellency, when yeah. I sat with the High Commissioner of South Africa to Ghana, uh -huh. she taught us how to make musho. Uh -huh. And it sounds very similar boiling the beans exactly. and then later on mm -hmm. adding the mm -hmm. spices and yeah. 
chopping the onions mm-hmm. and cooking it. And it's similar to, so ours is, I mean, the preparation is very different, but we have something called red red. I don't know if you've had yes. any yet. Yes. Red red. So, so basically red palm oil. We use it to make a bean stew. We usually use black eyed beans. And then, yeah, so again, boil the beans, put them down, and then now, you add your onions, ginger, you know, we like a lot of pepper, hot yes. pepper, chili pepper here. In Kenya, um, it's probably the Costarians <laughs> who like the chilies, but most of the up country, we don't. The we milder, like milder flavors. Oh, interesting. Okay, okay. And then there's a cake. I think before we move to that, I would want to add that this is our staple food. Yeah. Oh. You know, so where we come from, a lot of these is what is eaten almost on a daily basis. I see. Uh, anything else is really a change of diet, but this is really the staple. Yes. Oh, yes, oh, I know yes. you yes. got it very yes. well. A little bit of that, but yeah. this ordinary day is the staple food. You go to every home, there is this on a regular basis. Wow. Yeah, from where we come from. Yeah. Well, that's, that's pretty oh, interesting. But what kind of beans? Um, actually, you can use more than one type of bean. There's okay. no specific bean that you're supposed to use. You can basically use anything okay. Okay. in your githeri. Mm. Sometimes you can mix the beans, depending on what you like, but there's no specific okay. bean. Okay. And then the cake is your work too. Yeah. You need this whole cake. You know what? I feel so honored. <laughs> mm. So what kind of cake is it? It's a coffee cake, okay. and I use the Kenyan the coffee. The Kenyan coffee. <laughs> yeah. So how? Okay. So I need mean, basic preparation of the cake. Is there anything special that you did with it that makes it your own unique thing or more of a Kenyan thing? No, not really. It's just a cake I like to bake, so I bake something small. It's it's a lovely cake, Thank and you. I can't wait to taste it. Thank you so much, Candy. I know I've pulled you away from. <laughs> And you were expecting to be on TV, but, no. but thank you, thank you for speaking on the camera. So um, if, uh, I'm, I'm going to let you go. Okay. I know you have other things to do. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, and I'll come back so that we we actually do the preparation together because I sure. really like to learn. Yeah. I'd love to teach you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Your Excellency. Thank you very much. I think that was a great conversation. So yes. I have chai masala here. Yeah. One of my favorites, but I don't know how it's made. <laughs> oh, you know, in Kenya, um, any time is tea time. Mm-hmm. So we have uh, really that slogan. And it is true because um, you take tea as you wake up, you wake, take tea the whole day and take tea out the way to bedtime. Um, a lot of the the, the 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 way the tea is prepared in Kenya is you boil water, you pour tea, excuse me. Okay. This one you allow it to boil. Yes. Uh, if you come from the co- community I come from, then you add milk mm. and allow it to boil completely. Yes. You know, you boil it, it cooks completely. You know, it boils completely, and then you sieve the tea and then pour into a thermos or into a jug and that is how you get the milk tea. Of course, if you go to big restaurants, ordinarily they will not have the time to do that. What they will do is they will mix water, they will give you separate water, separate milk and tea bags. And uh, we have tea bags. That box there uh, has tea bags. So you, that has about 100 tea bags, okay. very high premium quality, it's a kind of tea that you find everywhere globally. Um, it's um, the most sought tea anywhere in, in the world and we do a lot of uh, um, sale of, uh, of the tea because mm. it comes from a very... I, I know the brand but I actually never knew it was Kenyan, so that's very impressive. <laughs> yes, this is the purely... Name means How do you pronounce the name? Uh, Kericho Gold. Kericho. Kericho, Kericho Gold. Gold. Kericho is one of the areas where we have the biggest tea estates. Okay. Uh, those are commercial estates. Mm-hmm. But also we have other type of teas that are a small scale. And actually a majority of the Kenyan tea is small scale. Okay. And why it has a lot of value and the taste and the quality that you 
everybody talks about, it is because of the process of picking. Mm. You do, it is very carefully selected. You only pick the bud and two leaves. I see. You know, the bud and two leaves below that. That is what you pick uh, for processing. And therefore you have the best flavor from that. So, so we is um, we, you're not really begin your day without a cup of tea. <laughs> you will not end your day without a cup of tea. And I want to invite you really to taste that and sample yeah. uh, the Kenyan tea uh, that is completely, okay. you know, brewed. You know, yes, is brewed. Okay, so I think there's some here. Yes. Right. So okay. So let so, me. So uh, yeah, please help okay. yourself. Uh, yes. That one, I think. Yes, that one has uh, is a. Could you is a, pass me one of the cups? Oh yes. Oh yeah. You know. Okay. Here you and go. Here. Okay. So this is. This is a brewed tea. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's better when it doesn't have sugar. You don't need okay, to add so sugar. Okay. So I'll add sugar mm -hmm. to this one. Yes. Okay. There we go. This is a brew tea. Mm -hmm. Okay. What kind of milk do you usually use? Well, um, in, since we are in, in Ghana, uh, <laughs> we really having to go to the to the supermarket yes. and buy the, you know, the packed mm. milk. Okay. So, but, so uh, use the one in the cart. So we use the, the one the that is the, 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 the long. Milk. No, no, it's actually okay. the what we call the the long life. But okay. you know, you pick from the shelves yes. and uh, you have. If you came to my village, then of course, I will go to the. You milk is fresh. It will be fresh, <laughs> very different and very tasty. You know, yeah. yeah. That's and interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just taste. And then how how is the tea itself? Because I'm tasting. I know this. I, okay, so what I had before was a chai masala without the milk. Uh huh. Right, and I taste ginger, lots of interesting spices. What is, am I right? Is it yes, yes, absolutely, right? yes. Okay. Yeah. This is delicious. It's very nice. I have had uh, friends from oh. Ghana, but they tell me, you know, um, they don't take tea with milk. And for some reason, uh, it hasn't come to my mind why, because we're importing a lot of milk into this market. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. Well, I don't so like my tea with milk, but yeah. a lot of Ghanaians do. In fact, this cup, and my viewers will bear me witness, it's too small for a Ghanaian breakfast. Yes. <laughs> you need to have a really big mug. Yes, we have bigger mugs. Yeah. Pour half a tin of evaporated milk in and make the tea. But mm -hmm. personally, I like to taste the flavors of yes. the tea. So, yes. But, but this, I can have this all day, every day. And there's not even any sugar in it. Absolutely. And I like it tastes a lot better, of yes. sugar. No, it tastes better. <laughs> it tastes better without sugar. Well, this is nice. Mm. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So, what um, flavors am I tasting in the tea? One is uh, the tea itself. Okay. With the tea, the, the tea itself, and of course, uh, we add a little bit of ginger mm. just to give it a taste that uh, you 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 pick from the from okay. the tea. That's the only thing that okay. we do. There isn't any other flavor, and a little bit of that milk. And I think that is a product that we would want to bring to the people of Ghana. Yeah, so yeah. We'll, we'll buy it. So anyone out there really looking for partnership on how to import and really bring it to the shelves right. of our good people of Ghana, our good friends. I mean, most of us. We would be tea. very delighted to have that conversation and see whether we can really, because uh, I yeah. think it is important to promote yeah. African products within the continent. Absolutely. Itself. I mean, we import a lot of tea. So a we, lot. Yeah. yeah. But it's not from the continent it's not from the continent. so if we we, we we get to import from a sister country why not so your excellency um, while we taste and enjoy all these things i want us to talk a little bit about your experience in ghana so far i know it's not been so long yes and like we keep saying the pandemic has also come to muddy the waters mm. but from what you have experienced what, what has it been like Phenomenal. Um, because um, for some reason, I haven't felt like I, uh, I, I migrated from Kenya to Ghana. So when I came in, I fitted seamlessly. And all of us have fitted that way. 
for good reasons that the Ghanaian people are very, very accommodative and very welcoming. Mm. I think that's a really a quality all of us need to uh, pick from yourselves and are uh, very helpful. Uh, we've met very polite people and um, everybody is uh, really willing to give you a hand. Whenever you need some help, they are always available to do that. Have you had any, I mean, since we're talking about food, any Ghanaian food yet? You mentioned that you tasted the red red. Yes. That's one of my favorite. Oh, Banku. Oh, you like Banku? Oh, Banku, you know. <laughs> it's not too far off from our own Ugali. True. The only difference is uh, yours is sour. Yes. A little bit sour, and of course yeah. you have to pull it a little That's bit. True. Yeah. It is yeah. not really so, yeah. Breaks, right? Break, really breaks, uh, yeah. but this one you have to really to pull it it's a little true. bit. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. What do you yeah. like to eat it with? Uh, the the banku. Um, you know, the interesting thing about your cuisine is generally every sauce you pick has fish. It, well, well, okay. yes. And uh, of course, I enjoy fish. No doubt about it. Sometimes I don't follow what else is in the fish. I only follow the fish, you know. And it has been exciting. So, so do you like the banku with the pepper and the fish, or with the okra stew and okra soup, or anything goes? Because you like the banku. I, I actually don't select. To me, when it comes to meal time. I have no choice. You're an African man. Yes, absolutely. You know, and I have enjoyed every meal, really. Well, it's a bit spicy, I must admit. Uh, every time I walk into a restaurant, I keep saying I wish it was a little, uh, you know, less spicy. But again, you know, we are in this environment, and actually, spice also, you know, it has a lot of vitamins and food, yes. and therefore, yeah. it should give you better appetite. <laughs> and I have a good appetite, so I have enjoyed every real moment. Uh, apart from Banku, have you had any of our yam dishes? Because I know you have a lot of yam, you mentioned where you come from yes. in, in Kenya. Yeah. Have you had any of our yam dishes yet? I'll tell you this, our breakfast, on, uh, on average, yeah, <coughs> has to have sweet potato, <laughs> which we have. But uh, I'm, I'm not surprised if it is, uh, yeah, his breakfast is sweet potato, mm. it's yam, it's plantain. That's, that, you know? that's very interesting. And uh, anything else, but really that forms the, the, the core. So we have eaten enough yams in this country. In fact, my only regret is uh, we haven't been able to import the variety of yam seedling from Ghana to Kenya. Just to really add value to our, you know, our yam, because I think in terms of quantity, mm. I have seen yam that can feed a whole family for three, four days. In Ghana. In Ghana, you know. And beyond that, I think it's, it's softer. It's softer and therefore you can quickly uh, prepare a meal out of it, in fact, uh, which is unlike ours is a bit crispy, crispy okay. and a bit hard. Okay, so and usually it doesn't get really that big, okay. you know. But here, I think it's something that we need to learn in terms of either propagation or in terms of your technology and science on how you have been able to really breed the yam to that level. Yes, I mean, we have different varieties as well. Yeah. Some of the two of the most popular, we have the water yam mm -hmm. and we have puna. So water yam looks a little whiter and... Ah, that's yes, the one. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. a little whiter and it's... it's exactly like puna. Water yam for a reason. Mm. It has a lot of moisture I see. content. The puna is not as watery, mm -hmm. but still soft and mm -hmm. more yellowish when you cut through it. I see. And that's that's where you see for fried yam most mm -hmm. of the time. If you've mm -hmm. had the fried yam that, yes. that we eat with mm -hmm. fried fish yes. <laughs> a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing yam fufu even, puna works as well. Um, and things like in poton poto, mashed yam, we, we use the light soup, add a little bit of palm oil to it. Mm -hmm. So it becomes like a pottage, yes. you know. We use that a lot too. So yeah, we have different varieties, but you're right, our yams, they can get pretty big, you know, especially when it's in season. Yes. Yeah. 
In fact, that is what we should be looking for if we are talking about food security. And I know, of course, ours is uh, drought resistance, yeah. so it survives even when the rain doesn't mm. really uh, come along or when the rain is not as, as was expected, including uh, cassava. I forgot to mention that yeah. cassava is actually part of our breakfast <laughs> diet, you know. That's very, so you, have, so you very, have two birds for breakfast. It's, it's very nice. Well, yeah. I guess there are people in Ghana who eat yam and sweet potatoes and yes. two birds for breakfast. So it, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So we, sense. I find it, I mean, it's natural. I, I, I want to believe it's healthier mm -hmm. than uh, cereals and uh, processed uh, food that we get from the supermarket and stuff. So when you get that kind of food, I believe really it is good. And it is also important mm. that we tell the world that the product that we produce in the continent really is good and is worthwhile. So we need to orient our people to begin to consume uh, our own foods, foods that we grow mm. and foods that will help us sustain ourselves and for a longer period of time, other than having to go to the market to buy some of these things. I agree yeah. with you. So Your Excellency, I want us to wrap this conversation up now. I'm going to ask you or mention for you 10 different words and I just want you to tell me the first thing that comes to mind when I mention any of those words. Mm. Okay? So the first one, passion. Passion, my passion is actually uh, to grow relationships. Okay. Uh, at personal and also at official level. Okay. I have a passion for that. Okay. Yeah. Food. Oh, food. Ah, every time I look forward to a meal time, and of course, uh, I haven't forgotten my roots. So, uh, you'll be told, Gedari is one of my <laughs> favorite years. It's, it's actually is very nice. So, it's something that we can have the whole week long without okay. having to complain. Okay, yeah. culture the Ghanaians actually are very rich in culture for two reasons. One, uh, when I look at uh, the kingship. You know, to date, it's very interesting how community revolves around a king, and the king to date mm. has a lot of say in what happens in the in, in 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 the country, what happens in the community, and how resources and land is managed and shared. So I find that very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Fashion. African really is a good dress. Uh, something like this. I think it's a good thing and it looks elegant. Music. We have the bongo music, which is a Swahili blend, uh, which extends also to Lingala, uh, which you can actually call the, you know, the Congolese music because a lot of it is actually Swahili, a mix of all that. And it's very interesting. Dance. Rumba. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Rumba. Love. Hmm. My wife. Okay. Okay. Well, it depends again. Love has many definitions <laughs> because um, if you look at it, it can be fraternal, it can be you know agape, it can be all that kind of thing. But really, I think when you're looking at it, love revolves around really the human person. Right. You know. So I think all of us really need to extend, and everybody needs to feel loved. Okay. And by the way, so you extend love for you to be loved. Okay. Now, the parameters are different uh, from how you relate or uh, how you define your love between the communities. But again, uh, human beings, yes, have love for human beings. Relaxation. Oh, relaxation. Whenever I have time, I take a walk. Okay. Whenever I have time, I take a walk. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just, just to relax a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Book. Book. I knew that was coming. <laughs> books. I have a variety, you know, of books. So, uh, books. You can talk about those that talk about motivation. You can talk about those that talk about leadership. You can talk about the books that uh, really speaks to our industry, uh, the diplomacy, so to speak. Uh, there's a book I'm reading. I'm hoping I can remember the title that talks about the evolution as well as the management of uh, the institutions of Ministry of Foreign Affairs and diplomacy as a whole Absolutely. in a comparative perspective. So it speaks about, in fact, the case study of about 12 countries. Okay. I mean, the middle of that, just to learn how to how the ministry 
uh, is, is shaped, uh, how the leadership is developed, mm. how the recruitment is done, how the promotion are done, how discipline <laughs> is made. It's a 360. It's a, it's a very interesting book. I'm, I'm trying, I don't know why my, it has skipped my mind, but the, the challenge I think is because it's online. Yeah. So uh, you, you don't the have the, 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 the cover. cover and uh, therefore you, so you every time you're moving from one page to the other. But it's a very, very interesting book. So I keep myself a little bit busy. I should have had a library there. So next time you come, I'm sure you have you have a book to pick. I will. But make sure you return. I will. <laughs> because uh, that's the biggest challenge. Oh, no, I Books don't come back. We'll, we'll, I hope you, have, yes. you don't have that experience. I will return. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the last word, Africa. Africa, I think, is on a renaissance. And any one of us listening to our leadership, I think, really must walk the talk. That Africa will not be developed, Africa will not be served, Africa will not be run by any other people but the African themselves. And we have made commitments at the African Union on where we want to be. The, uh, 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 around the Agenda 2063. So there are a number of areas that will take a little bit of time to get there. But foremost, we must take advantage of the natural resources that we have. We must take advantage of the human capital that there is. We must take advantage of the many, many, many opportunities that the rest of the people are seeing, which for some reason we don't seem to see. And I think we all really need to open our eyes and ask ourselves, what is it that I can do for Africa? Mm. Not what Africa can do for myself. Mm. And now that we are on that subject, I think really what we are hoping and we are praying that will make the difference is the signature of the African Frequent Trade Area, which luckily is actually hosted in this capital. Your yeah. Excellency, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you for spending two clear weeks with me thank you very much <laughs> i am very very grateful very honored and you are welcome and we've not been able to give you an official welcome to ghana because of the times mm. i mean the time we should have done that yeah. the pandemic hit but nonetheless you're very welcome and uh, we're always here when you need us thank do let us know We'll come back again and learn yeah, how to please. make some of these yeah. things. You're not leaving until it is this. No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to eat so, all of yeah. it. So I, we, I, we I just want to. This is all made for us. I just want to settle <laughs> them and and sign out so that I can dig in. But thank you so 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 much, and thank you for introducing your family to us as well. We're very very grateful for that. So viewers, I have been speaking to His Excellency. Eliphas Barine and your excellency I have a, a gift for you we have a gift for you <laughs> thank you thank you very much so, this is a Ghanaian brand and okay so the Aha brand but they also have a, a men's line called wow. um, Lauren wow. Taylor wow. And so it's a gift from us thank you, you so so, so, <laughs> so much it's from me from the whole crew wonderful from city tv wonderful Matic license wonderful thank wonderful. you wonderful wonderful <laughs> wonderful thank you thank you so much you're very welcome thank you very much thank, thank you. you thank you uh, yeah thank you very much <laughs> thank you yeah so of course as we say next time um once we settle down i really look forward to inviting you again then we can probably spend an afternoon yes there is one th one very popular dish that we have not introduced. Okay. I'm sure anybody who has visited Kenya has eaten nyamachoma. Oh yes, <laughs> you know? it's it's my producer's favorite. They they were quickly say yes. shout out to you. Nya, nya, nyamachoma. We can't stop talking about so, nyamachoma. So 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 next time that we we are here, we are hoping that we also be having someone to help us through with some of these things, and we can have the whole afternoon just spend a little bit of time. Let me thank the team that here. Uh, has joined you. I yes. think it has been a yes. grueling Thank moment. Thank you guys. A lot of, All the people a lot behind of commitment the scene. and effort. Yes. I have a whole team here. Yeah, no. whole team. Thank, Thank you, you all. Much. So look we out for their names it. in the end credits. The end credits actually mean something. Look out for their names. <laughs> Viewers, this has been yeah. Diplomatic License on City TV. I'm very grateful to have had His Excellency Elifas Barine, the High Commissioner of Kenya to Ghana, spending two weeks with us. And we've done farming, we've, we've hiked, we've jogged, 
we, we've played golf and finally we, we've come to his home and we've experienced Kenya through him and his wonderful family and I want you to stay tuned and don't miss a thing. See you next time.